Many people don't realize this, but the majority of the world is not connected to the internet. How do we get cost-effective, inexpensive, and reliable connectivity to the remaining five or six billion people in the world who don't have it? Yeah, we can be up in an hour. Okay. Project Loon is the idea that we could create a network of high altitude balloons that float about 20 kilometers up, and through this network, we can give the internet to the entire world. Our balloons are these great big round things, about 15 meters in diameter, but you'd have to have a telescope if you wanted to see one up in the sky. So here's the surface of the planet. From here, right up to about 10 kilometers, this is where rain happens, this is where mountains are, and pretty much all aircraft fly down here. Now, here's our little balloon up here. This is right around 20 kilometers, actually in the stratosphere. And the stratosphere is different because we tend to have layers of wind that go in very particular directions. And by moving up and down through these different layers, we can steer. So by catching the right wind, we can keep the balloons together enough to give good coverage on the ground. We can sail with the winds and shape the waves and patterns of these balloons so that when one balloon leaves, another balloon is set to take its place. The balloons communicate with specialized internet antennas on the ground. So this antenna here points up at the sky and talks to this balloon. And each one of these balloons talks to their neighboring balloons and then back down to the ground station, which is connected to the local internet provider. What this does is it creates a network in the sky. Well, let's carry on then, we need to get that antenna on. Yeah. We've designed our radios and antennas specifically to receive signals from Project Loon only in order to achieve the high bandwidth over long distances involved. If we didn't filter out the other signals, the technology just wouldn't work. I got it. The balloons are completely solar powered and we control them through Loon Mission Control. All right, I think your plan is great. Do the ascent on 46 and 47. Set, try it like an hour after float. Yeah. Okay, we're going to be off the ground in a couple minutes. Before we send them up, we talk to air traffic control. We let them know these balloons are on the way up so they know where they are. And before they come down, we also talk to air traffic control. We can direct them to land in various collection points around the world in order to reuse and recycle their parts. Now, we have some ability to steer in general. However, in the stratosphere, most of the time, the winds actually flow from west to east. Because the winds generally circulate this way, we typically will have bands of our balloons that will be around the world at different latitudes. So if the balloons are circling around the bottom half of the world, eventually the balloon that's over South Africa will pass over South America. One, two, three. Woo! We're using the sunlight, we're using the wind, we're using all of these things to build this network in the sky. Project Loon is working to bring the technologies of access to everyone on the planet. One of the goals with Loon is to provide coverage for as many people in the world as possible. Um, but we want good coverage for these people, not just coverage every so often when a balloon passes by. So you absolutely have to have these balloons nicely spaced out over the world. And we have to guarantee there's always a balloon available to move in whenever another balloon moves out. And I thought, hey, I, I could do a simulation of this. So nobody really asked me. I just thought, well, let's try this. This could be fun. So this is one of the balloon simulations I made. This is a simulation of a bunch of imaginary balloons and how they move in some real-world wind data that's available to the public. Each of these balloons considers what different winds are available at different levels in the stratosphere and then changes level to catch whichever wind is most appropriate. The red dots correspond to balloons that are low down in the stratosphere and the blue dots correspond to balloons that are higher up in the stratosphere and the balloons that are changing colour are changing altitude. 
In order to change how the balloons are spaced out, I can control a bunch of parameters here. For example, I can modify parameters that control how fast the balloons can climb, how fast they can drop, how high and how low they can travel, and this allows them to catch different currents in the wind. So we, we iterated probably through hundreds of these little questions. And that's a great thing about simulation is that you can try all kinds of different ideas very quickly. One place we can look for inspiration is in nature. In my early simulations, each balloon does something similar to what birds do. They just look to their near neighbours and try to spread themselves out nicely compared to the others. But as we move forward, we may use methods that take into account everything. So every balloon essentially will have information about what every other balloon is doing. The future will probably be a much more sophisticated simulation method. The real goal here was to find out, is it possible to have a nicely spaced out flock of balloons? And the answer is yes. Once people could see that this was possible, it became a feasible project, not just some crazy science project. The altitude that we fly at is actually above 99% of the atmosphere, which means that we have a lot of the same physical challenges as flying in outer space, and yet we still have to deal with the chaotic nature of the wind patterns. We need to know what the winds are in the stratosphere so we can surf those winds in order to go different places. We've been using some wonderful data we have from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which gives us their best predictions of which directions the winds are blowing up in the stratosphere. They get their data from things like weather balloons, but as a weather balloon goes up, it gets larger and larger until eventually it pops. So the amount of time it spends in the stratosphere is pretty limited. In comparison, we all have a fleet of balloons that are in the air all the time. And of course we have GPS so we can see which ways the wind is blowing us. And so we all have a very rich stream of data coming into our system. You can kind of imagine putting a whole bunch of rubber ducks on a lake or an ocean and watch where they float to, you'd get a very good idea of what the water currents are doing, whereas our balloons would show you what the air currents are doing. So this simulation shows how we use the wind data to predict a balloon's trajectory. In this video, the red dot in the center is the balloon and the arrows around it are the predicted wind field. So you can see as the wind field changes, the red arrow shows the velocity of the balloon as it travels through this ever-changing wind field. One question you might have is, are our balloons actually flying at the same speed as the wind? And it turns out that we can tell that they are because we've actually flown microphones on our balloons and it's very quiet when we're flying in the stratosphere. That tells us there's no wind rushing past and that's because we're flying at the same speed as the wind around us. Right now we're only flying a few balloons but we're already gathering a lot of really exciting data that's helping us understand the stratospheric winds better. And as we have better understanding, that's enabling us to fly more balloons with greater confidence and provide ourselves with even more data. And so we have this ever improving understanding of the stratosphere. We've actually been talking to NOAA and working with them to feed some of the data from our balloons back into their models. And as our fleet comes fully online, we'll be able to significantly improve the quality of the wind predictions that NOAA is able to provide to others as well.